necessary. Historians now realize that the American Revolution itself was not only ideological, but also the result of devotion to the creed and institutions of libertarianism. The American revolutionaries were steeped in the creed of libertarianism, an ideology which led them to resist with their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor the invasions of their rights and liberties committed by the imperial British government. Historians have long debated the precise causes of the American Revolution. Were they constitutional, economic, political, or ideological? We now realize that, being libertarians, the revolutionaries saw no conflict between moral and political rights on the one hand and economic freedom on the other. On the contrary, they perceived civil and moral liberty, political independence, and the freedom to trade and produce as all part of one unblemished system, what Adam Smith was to call, in the same year that the Declaration of Independence was written, the obvious and simple system of natural liberty. The libertarian creed emerged from the classical liberal movements of the 17th and 18th century in the Western world, specifically from the English Revolution of the 17th century. This radical libertarian movement, even though only partially successful in its birthplace, Great Britain, was still able to usher in the Industrial Revolution there by freeing industry and production from the strangling restrictions of state control and urban government-supported guilds. For the classical liberal movement was, throughout the Western world, a mighty libertarian revolution against what we might call the old order, the ancien régime, which had dominated its subjects for centuries. This regime had, in the early modern period, beginning in the sixteenth century, imposed an absolute central state and a king ruling by divine right on top of an older, restrictive web of feudal land monopolies and urban guild controls and restrictions. The result was a Europe stagnating under a crippling web of controls, taxes, and monopoly privileges to produce and sell, conferred by central and local governments upon their favorite producers. This alliance of the new bureaucratic, war-making central state with privileged merchants, an alliance to be called mercantilism by later historians, and with a class of ruling feudal landlords, constituted the old order against which the new movement of classical liberals and radicals arose and rebelled in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries. The object of the classical liberals was to bring about individual liberty in all of its interrelated aspects. In the economy, taxes were to be drastically reduced, controls and regulations eliminated, and human energy, enterprise, and markets set free to create and produce in exchanges that would benefit everyone and the mass of consumers. Entrepreneurs were to be free at last to compete, to develop, to create. The shackles of control were to be lifted from land, labor, and capital alike. Personal freedom and civil liberty were to be guaranteed against the depredations and tyranny of the king or his minions. Religion, the source of bloody wars for centuries when sects were battling for control of the state, was to be set free from state imposition or interference, so that all religions or non-religions could coexist in peace. Peace, too, was the foreign policy credo of the new classical liberals, the age-old regime of imperial and state aggrandizement for power and pelf was to be replaced by a foreign policy of peace and free trade with all nations. And since war was seen as engendered by standing armies and navies, by military power always seeking expansion, these military establishments were to be replaced by voluntary local militia, by citizen civilians who would only wish to fight in defense of their own particular homes and neighborhoods. Thus the well-known theme of separation of church and state was but one of many interrelated motifs that could be summed up as separation of the economy from the state, separation of speech and press from the state, separation of land from the state, separation of war and military affairs from the state. Indeed, the separation of the state 
from virtually everything. The state, in short, was to be kept extremely small, with a very low, nearly negligible budget. The classical liberals never developed a theory of taxation, but every increase in a tax and every new kind of tax was fought bitterly, in America twice becoming the spark that led, or almost led, to the revolution, the stamp tax, the tea tax. The earliest theoreticians of libertarian classical liberalism were the levelers during the English Revolution, and the philosopher John Locke in the late 17th century, followed by the true Whig, or radical libertarian opposition to the Whig settlement, the regime of 18th century Britain. John Locke set forth the natural rights of each individual to his person and property. The purpose of government was strictly limited to defending such rights. In the words of the Lockean-inspired Declaration of Independence, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. While Locke was widely read in the American colonies, his abstract philosophy was scarcely calculated to rouse men to revolution. This task was accomplished by radical Lockeans in the 18th century, who wrote in a more popular, hard-hitting, and impassioned manner, and applied the basic philosophy to the concrete problems of the government, and especially the British government, of the day. The most important writing in this vein was Cato's Letters, a series of newspaper articles published in the early 1720s in London by true Whigs John Trenchard and Thomas Gordon. While Locke had written of the revolutionary pressure which could properly be exerted when government became destructive of liberty, Trenchard and Gordon pointed out that government always tended toward such destruction of individual rights. According to Cato's letters, human history is a record of irrepressible conflict between power and liberty, with power, government, always standing ready to increase its scope by invading people's rights and encroaching upon their liberties. Therefore, Cato declared, power must be kept small and faced with eternal vigilance and hostility on the part of the public, to make sure that it always stays within its narrow bounds. We know by infinite examples and experience that men possessed of power, rather than part with it, will do anything, even the worst and the blackest, to keep it. And scarce ever any man upon earth went out of it as long as he could carry everything his own way in it. This seems certain that the good of the world, or of their people, was not one of their motives, either for continuing in power or for quitting it. It is the nature of power to be ever encroaching and converting every extraordinary power granted at particular times and upon particular occasions into an ordinary power, to be used at all times, and when there is no occasion. Nor does it ever part willingly with any advantage. Alas, power encroaches daily upon liberty, with a success too evident, and the balance between them is almost lost. Tyranny has engrossed almost the whole earth, and striking at mankind root and branch makes the world a slaughterhouse, and will certainly go on to destroy, till it is either destroyed itself, or, which is most likely, has left nothing else to destroy. Such warnings were eagerly imbibed by the American colonists, who reprinted Cato's letters many times throughout the colonies and down to the time of the Revolution. Such a deep-seated attitude led to what the historian Bernard Balin has aptly called the transforming radical libertarianism of the American Revolution. For the Revolution was not only the first successful modern attempt to throw off the yoke of Western imperialism, at that time of the world's mightiest power. More important, for the first time in history Americans hedged in their new governments with numerous limits and restrictions embodied in constitutions, and particularly in bills of rights. 
Church and state were rigorously separated throughout the new states, and religious freedom enshrined. Remnants of feudalism were eliminated throughout the states by the abolition of the feudal privileges of entail and primogeniture. In the former, a dead ancestor is able to entail landed estates in his family forever, preventing his heirs from selling any part of the land. In the latter, the government requires sole inheritance of property by the oldest son. The new federal government formed by the Articles of Confederation was not permitted to levy any taxes upon the public, and any fundamental extension of its powers required unanimous consent by every state government. Above all, the military and war-making power of the national government was hedged in by restraint and suspicion, for the eighteenth-century libertarians understood that war, standing armies, and militarism had long been the main method for aggrandizing state power. Bernard Balin has summed up the achievement of the American revolutionaries. The modernization of American politics and government during and after the Revolution took the form of a sudden radical realization of the program that had first been fully set forth by the opposition intelligentsia, in the reign of George I. Where the English opposition, forcing its way against a complacent social and political order, had only striven and dreamed, Americans, driven by the same aspirations, but living in a society in many ways modern and now released politically, could suddenly act. Where the English opposition had vainly agitated for partial reforms, American leaders moved swiftly and with little social disruption to implement systematically the outermost possibilities in the whole range of radically libertarian ideas. In the process, they infused into American political culture the major themes of eighteenth-century radical libertarianism brought to realization here. The first is the belief that power is evil, a necessity, perhaps, but an evil necessity, that it is infinitely corrupting, and that it must be controlled, limited, restricted in every way compatible with a minimum of civil order. Written Constitutions the separation of powers, bills of rights, limitations on executives, on legislatures and courts, restrictions on the right to coerce and wage war, all express the profound distrust of power that lies at the ideological heart of the American Revolution, and that has remained with us as a permanent legacy ever after. Thus, while classical liberal thought began in England, it was to reach its most consistent and radical development, and its greatest living embodiment, in America. For the American colonies were free of the feudal land monopoly and aristocratic ruling caste that was entrenched in Europe. In America, the rulers were British colonial officials and a handful of privileged merchants, who were relatively easy to sweep aside when the revolution came, and the British government was overthrown. Classical liberalism, therefore, had more popular support and met far less entrenched institutional resistance in the American colonies than it found at home. Furthermore, being geographically isolated, the American rebels did not have to worry about the invading armies of neighboring counter-revolutionary governments, as, for example, was the case in France. Thus America, above all countries, was born in an explicitly libertarian revolution, a revolution against empire, against taxation, trade monopoly and regulation, and against militarism and executive power. For a New Liberty, The Libertarian Manifesto, by Murray N. Rothbard, read by Jeff Riggenbach.